So let's look at a discrete model of the heat equation in one dimension. So we'll look at discretizing this on, on the real line. So first off, consider a random walk on the line that has distance step h and time step tau. So what that means is, is we're going to be starting with a, a point mass at 0, like, like we have here. And then um, at any uh, time step, it can move either to the right or to the left, and it's random but it ha happens with equal probability. So there's a likelihood of one half that it goes either direction. So if we look at the probability distribution then for what happens um, at time, uh, time one, then what things are going to look like? Well, let's see. Um, well, now uh, there's a one half likelihood that it's gone to the left and one half likelihood that it's gone to the right. So each of these now are at height one half. This is time uh, time tau, so one time step forward into the future. And then if we um, go again one time step into the future from there, so at time uh, two tau, then what happens is the um, this this guy on the left. Well, he could have gone to the left with uh, likelihood one one quarter, and he could have gone to the right with li likelihood one quarter, which would put him back here. But keep in mind the uh, the other guy over here, so um, the one that's on the right, he also is jumping either way. And so if he had gone left with probability one half, then that would have added to this one, and so now. The one in the middle is back up to a half. Uh, so this is supposed to be, oh, maybe this is not to scale. And this is at height 1 fourth. And this is at height 1 fourth. Um, <coughs> yeah, OK. So I guess that's not quite to scale from the, the previous step. Oh, well. Um, and anyway, so this, this kind of thing continues onward. And it, it turns out that the distribution that you get here is, is what's called a binomial distribution. And it's actually um, a, a discrete version of, of the uh, Gaussian. And there's a way to make that precise, but I'm not going to do that today. So just going back to um, what we have here, let's see. Um, to formalize this, let um, PXY uh, be the probability of moving from, from location x to location y. And so we can think of this as an entry in a matrix. But for right now, um, so that would be like in the xth row and yth column. Uh, let me just elaborate on what I mean. So this is the probability that um, if you go one step into the future, so if you go tau into the future and get to y, given that you started at x. Okay, so this this is in in words in probability jargon. This is the um, probability that uh, your next location is y given that, or conditioned on the assumption that you're at x now. Whoops. OK. So <coughs> um, switch back to black. So, so what does that look like then? Well, then that actual function is going to be given by uh, you have one half uh, if y is equal to x plus h and one half if y is equal to x minus h and zero for any other value of y. So that's what this probability distribution looks like. So Again, if we think of um, PXY 
as the xyth entry of, of some matrix P, then P looks like uh, some big old matrix. Well, it's an infinite by infinite matrix because it's uh, for the whole line. But don't worry about that. Coming down the diagonal, there's going to be zeros. And then we've, we're going to have a 1 half to the left and a 1 half to the right of each one of these zeros. OK, so there's our big honking matrix. Uh, and then we can talk about our um, distribution at time 0. So this is, this is our um, probability distribution. of the location of the uh, the random walker, the random particle. At the um, at the start, so when time is equal to zero, and so we're going to start them at the origin with probability one. So that means that there's going to be uh, it's going to be a vector with an infinite number of zeros, and then a one, and then the rest are all going to be zeros again. So it looks like that. Okay, so if we want to look uh, forward in time, then if I'm wondering about where I'm likely to find him one step into the future, this looks like this row vector x0 times the matrix P. And so what will that do? Well, that will just actually, um, by matrix multiplication, select the, the row of P corresponding to... Um, Zero. So if, if this is the uh, the one corresponding to zero, the zeroth row right there, well, they all look the same. So it's sort of hard to distinguish. But whatever. It's going to be zero, zero, one half, zero, one half, zero, zero, and then the rest will all be zeros again, like so. So that's what it looks like. So this is this is I'm just drawing uh, right now, and sorry, I'm just making right now in in matrices. Um, what what I was drawing back here. So oh sorry that's off the screen. There. So so I've got here's my, my time equals zero and then my time equals one. And then if I multiply it again to see what happens on, on the next um whoa. If I multiply it again to see what happens at the uh the the next step of the, the random walk, then what do we have? Um, uh, well, we just keep multiplying by p. So, so more generally, um, our location after n time steps is going to be our location um, one time step earlier, so the n minus first time step, times p. And that'll work all the way back. And so, in fact, we can find out where we are in the nth time step by taking our initial distribution, x0, and multiplying it by p n times. And so each time we multiply by that matrix, it just sort of transitions us forward in time. And that, that gives us the, the uh, the, the distribution of where we find x after after n steps. And so, just as a side note, um, since um, what happens on the next step is entirely determined uh, by, by what is what things look like at the current step, This is what's called a Markov chain. So a Markov chain is a, a random process um, where whatever happens next is entirely determined by your present state. So there's no notion of history or, or memory. It doesn't matter how you got there. It only matters where you are now. So, um, so that's the distribution of where you are. 
we can also talk about what happens if if f is is some function so it assigns a number to tau and to 2 tau and to 0 and to minus tau and minus 2 tau all those points on the on the lattice where our little guy could be walking around um, oh I'm sorry I said tau I should have said h so um, <coughs> in the figure that I boxed before so let's see so if f is, is a function then if we multiply um, f on the left by p <coughs> then this is the this this gives you the expected value of f um after one step of the random walk And so let's see what I mean by that. So I'm going to have, um, say, here's some, some location x. And here's my function f. And then I've got uh, x plus h and x minus h. So then the value of f right now is this, this height, f of x, right here. Now. Um, this is where I'm assuming my random walker currently is. He's located at x. But he could go right with probability a half, and he could go left with probability a half. So he's going to be at either one of those locations on the next turn with probability 1 half. So if he goes to the, the left over here, then he's going to take this value here. So I get f of x minus h with probability 1 half. And if he goes to the right, then I'm going to get, uh, he's going to land here, and I'm going to get this value right there. So that would be f of x plus h, and that comes with probability 1 half. And so I add those two. And so this, this weighted average, this is the, um, well, it's the average, so it's the expected value. So it's um, the average where the, uh, the weighting is done by the likelihood of a given outcome multiplied by the value of that outcome. Okay, so... Um, if we look back at this, so let's see, so if we have, if we take zero steps of the random walk, then that just gives us uh, the function back again. So after taking no steps, the expected value is exactly what the value is. After taking one step of the random walk, this is just, well, you multiply p times f, and then you look at the the xth entry. And so like I said, that's going to be 1 half f of x minus h plus 1 half f of x plus h. OK. Um, now, if it turns out that p times f is equal to f so that it doesn't change, then that means that every uh, value of f is equal to the average of its neighboring values. And the name for that is we say that um, f is harmonic. It's a harmonic function. And we'll see later that, that uh, harmonic functions are functions of, of Laplace's equation. And, and actually, that happens right here as well. So. So if you take the limit as h tends to 0, um, then you get a solution of uh, uxx equals 0. And that is um, Laplace's equation. In, in one spatial dimension. Um, now, it turns out that any solutions for Laplace's equation, if you take a little disk around a point, then the average value of the function on that disk is equal to the value of the function at the center, and also for circles. So if you just take a circle and you look at the average value of the function on a circle of radius r around a point, then it's equal to the value at the center, and that's for any circle. 
so this this property of being sort of the average of the neighbors um, that always happens for for uh, solutions to Laplace's equation or harmonic functions so that's the equilibrium situation but what about if we're evolving in time so then if uh, if we take uxt if uxt is um, uh, a function that satisfies the uh, the difference relation that ux one time step into the future is equal to p times u at the previous step or in other words one half u x uh, x minus h t plus one half u x plus h t. So what do we have right there? We're saying that we um, look at the value of u at the left and the right of the current location and take that average and that's going to be our value at the current location at the next time step. Did that make sense? So if you're looking at location x, the value at x at the next time step is going to be the average of its the present values of its neighbors. Maybe that's a better way to say it. Okay, so so if we take u to be a function that satisfies this, and we let h tend to 0 and t tend to 0, but remembering the scaling that we have between uh, space and time, we do this in such a way that as they go to 0, um, we have uh, h squared over 2 tau always equal to d. then we get um, a solution of the heat equation in the limit. And so one key point about all this business with uh, discrete probability and so on and so forth um, is that it makes it really easy to compute solutions for uh, the heat equation and, and Laplace's equation using Monte Carlo methods. So Monte Carlo methods, this refers to the idea of um, doing a whole bunch of very quick calculations using random numbers, random draws, and um, yeah, basically that's that's it. I can give you some examples if you're interested of, of uh, Monte Carlo methods, um, but it basically means you just do a whole bunch of really quick simulations by having a computer that can spit out a large number of random numbers very quickly. Uh, and you just average those according to whatever averaging formula that, that you have. And um, you end up with a, a remarkably good approximation to your solution.